Well, welcome to another version of our uh, video interviews, and we're with the esteemed Middle Eastern uh, scholar and uh, and speaker, uh, David McCoskey. David, a St. Louis native, welcome back. Delighted to be back. He's going to be speaking at the Brodsky Library tonight, so we're Delighted. thrilled to have him in with us, Delighted. the esteemed editor-in-chief Emeritus, Bob Cohn. Bob, why don't you start us off with some questions for David. Well, David, we're pleased to welcome you back. The last time you were in St. Louis was the Can We Talk program, sponsored by the Light, the J.C. Right. Garcia Jewish right. Community Center. And you indicated that you and, and several other observers said there was a, perhaps a better than 50-50 chance that Israel might take a unilateral strike at the nuclear sites yeah. in Iran. Has the needle moved backwards or forwards on that, and why do you think it's, so? It's a very good question. I mean, I was just over there in September, and, you know, I think when I talked about that, you know, in March, I, 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 you know, I was afraid I would startle people. <laughs> I, I felt that that really was uh, the direction uh, pretty much till early September. Um, I think what, where the needle has, has pulled back is that the defense minister, Ayub Barak, uh, is, who's been kind of the, the point person of Israel in dealing with the United States has, um, you know, he's really met some real resistance. He wanted some U.S. acquiescence, uh, if not an outright blessing. And I think that um, it's, it's indicative of the strength of the U.S.-Israel security relationship that, ironically, the people most sensitive to the bilateral U.S.-Israel relationship really come out, out of the Ministry of Defense mm -hmm. and the IDF. They have daily contacts with their Pentagon counterparts. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's an indication of the vitality of the relationship that the sensitivities are so, are so acute that there's, uh, there's, there was a real desire not, you know, when, when there's a lot of American pushback, I think, um, Barack felt this is, you know, better to try to make sure w that Israel has gone the final mile in trying to reach common benchmarks with the U.S. on at what point will, you know, the United States views that this, um, that the Iranian nuclear program has had such progress that it would require American action. I also think, I mean, although never stated to me as such, but after having 15 meetings over there in <laughs> mid-September, that um, I also think it's only my personal view that I think the fact that Israelis think that Obama could win, they don't know that. Uh, since then, I, you know, there's been the, the Romney doing one of the debates, but I think that that has made them, and Barack in particular, more... Um, more sensitive to the consequences of um, of doing this in defiance of a of a sitting president who may win now may lose. Uh, I mean, I think it's worth you know as, as people who I know who, are, who are love the history of the U.S. Israel relationship to recall 1956 uh, yes. the Suez Crisis, right? Um, the Sinai campaign is known in Israel. Um, that actually happened before the 1956 elections. Mm -hmm. But the, the worst year in the history of U.S. Israel relations, uh, U.S. Israel relations to this very day, is 1957. Mm -hmm. So don't think that what you do before an election is insulated in a way uh, after the election. Uh, it, the consequences could be seen then, and you know I think that this is the the tension here remains. It has just been <coughs> deferred to, you know, next spring, next summer, uh, and I think there's, I thought it was regrettable, there was a series of public statements between the U.S. and Israel, a kind of war of words, which I feel the only winner, tragically, are the Iranians. Right, uh, yeah. When they see the U.S.-Israel squabble, they question the deterrent uh, capability of the U.S. If their best friends, the Israelis, don't think they're going to do it, then, then that emboldens them. So I tend to think that that was not the way to go. And there needs to be, I wrote an article in Foreign Policy called The Case for Humility, where both sides have reasons to be humble here. It, you know, as they pursue firm resolve with Iran, uh, for, the Is for Israel, there's no substitute for like uh, political intimacy with the President of the United States. And, and the United States, we have to be humble too, because let's be honest that 
our track record has not been great in stopping these nuclear countries. I mean, North Korea, Pakistan, Pakistan. as has been said uh, by others, Prime Minister Netanyahu approached me uh, a few weeks ago when I was there, and he credits me with the statement, but I don't really deserve the credit. It was, I told him, Mr. Prime Minister, it wasn't me, it was someone in your country who said it uh, about North Korea and Pakistan. The American approach has been too early, too early, oops, too late. Mm -hmm. So we both have to be humble by it, and uh, it's a very, very sensitive time in the relationship, and I was glad to see that um, things were not pushed to the to the limits, uh, but I don't I don't want to give you know your viewers uh, the wrong impression. I think the issue is it's very high up there. It's it's it's, it's just the, the the intensity of it has has dropped a bit as the U.S. and Israel through quiet channels, although not written about in the press, but are trying to find common benchmarks to gauge the progress of the Iranian nuclear program. And, and let's talk about Bibi's what, apparent change of public focus, yeah. um, you know, seeming to favor additional sanctions. Right. I mean, is that political? Is that recognition of this different reality? Is he hedging his bets in a U.S. political season or kind of all of the above? It's some of the above. Look, he, Barack has been his partner, and uh, the, the defense establishment uh, has been very solid on this saying uh, you know we the debate in Israel has been somewhat misconstrued I, the, the debate is there's no real what I call containment school in Israel there's no Sabina Brzezinski right. saying Israel can live with an Iranian nuclear bomb right. so the debate is narrower than it appears on the surface because it's more about who should do this what is the right timing to do this and it's really a question of it's somewhat more a debate about America than it is about Iran. That everyone says America has superior capabilities. That's not disputed in Israel. The question is, does America have superior, you know, have adequate resolve? That's the debate. And the defense establishment says, work it out with the Americans. Work it out with the Americans. The guy who who was, you know, felt that he he could find a way that America would acquiesce to Israel was Barack. Now, when Barack pulls back. Netanyahu's all alone. He mm. doesn't have the votes. And and he needs Barack as a defensivist here. You can't go against the generals right. and the defensivists. Right. I mean, that's, that's a little much. Right. So I think that Netanyahu pulls back because he didn't, wasn't able to engender the support he wanted. And Barack, as I was saying, I think the defense establishment is very sensitive to this idea of, America, of Israel inserting itself in an American election cycle that they felt very uncomfortable with. And their view was, look, so it's got to work with whoever wins, and and this is doing something on the eve of the election will bear consequences. So I th I see BB pulls back because he doesn't have the support. He he goes public in my view for reasons that maybe readers in the Jewish light won't believe, but it's the <laughs> truth. But in Israel, everything's stranger than fiction. You had a series of statements mm -hmm. that got a lot of press in Israel that were really not picked up here. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were they were mentioned, and I'm sure uh, mentioned well. Right. Um, uh, General Dempsey mm -hmm. uh, yeah. said uh, the United States won't be complicit in an Israeli attack. Mm -hmm. Well, in Israel, that was interpreted as when you're only complicit in a crime, and in their view, they saw that as a personal rebuke to them. Then Hillary Clinton, the day I was there, um, uh, said something. Well, we're not going to make any timetables, mm -hmm. and, and I think she meant in terms of timetables for war. And, and Netanyahu saw both of those public statements as targeting him. Yeah. And the answer should have been, call the White House. Right. Find out what's going on. But the Israeli style sometimes is if, if you're being perceived to be beating up, they're beating up on you as you push back publicly. And let me ask you a follow-up question on that. Sure. Notwithstanding these... These uh, the political rhetoric or the day-to-day -day nuances of what people say, which I understand from a diplomatic perspective, can be important, but sometimes they get right. inflated way out of proportion. Right. When you look at the political parties and the candidates yeah. in this election in this country, I mean, some have written that the actual substantive positions aren't that different. Go on now, the American one. Yeah. Yeah. Look, this gets me in an area that I don't, I have a hard enough time with Israelis and Palestinians and Arabs, so I don't, I'm, I tread very carefully. Not your opinion, just yeah, how do you yeah, analyze yeah, the yeah, yeah. positions? Yeah, yeah. Look, the 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 issue is that the um, on the issue of Iran, you have both countries saying 
you have both parties uh -huh. saying we don't want Iran to get a nuclear weapon. Right. It will lead to a nuclear arms race in the Middle East, which is already the most dangerous region in the right. world. So there's a consensus there. Um, there's a consensus also saying that if you did, if they got nukes, they could proliferate to non-state actors like Hezbollah, dirty bomb technology, all that stuff. So there's a consensus there. It could, it could lead to a change in the balance of power in the region. It would embolden right. extremists, intimidate moderates, lead to Gulf states to feel under the sway of Iran, change the price of oil. There's consensus on this. The question tends to be at what point does the United States um, either intercede or um, or does Israel or does the United States, if you know, um, at what point do they acquiesce to some action taken by Israel? Yeah. So, and then here it gets a little murky, and it's hard to know in a campaign because there's so many different constituencies. Like, in the, let's say in the Republican primary, Romney spoke about stopping them with the capability state. Right. Then he was interviewed by George Stephanopoulos on ABC News during the general election now, and he said, I agree with the president. They, right. they shouldn't just get a weapon. Then his advisor said, you misspoke, you know, and then he said, oh, yeah, that's right, capability. <laughs> but yeah. it made people wonder if that was really his position. So it's unclear. Um, you know, to me, the question is, the question is, um, if Iran does make progress in the hardest part of making a bomb is the nuclear fuel. And you go from reactor-grade nuclear right. fuel to, to weapons-grade nuclear fuel. Right. So the, the question, and I, I think the Israelis are right on this, is to say, how will you know when they enrich and convert from low enrich to high enrich? And what will you, how will you act on what you know? Mm -hmm. Those are the two questions. Yeah. And, and, and that is... Because a lot of our information, and it's public to say this, I'm not saying anything secret, um, we get from the International Atomic Energy Agency mm -hmm. inspectors yeah, who right. go to these places. But it's not like we have with the Soviet Union, uh, the Russia, these people, the Soviet yeah. Union, where it's like a constant feed, um, and we always know what's going on. Basically, they go for anywhere from four to eight weeks, yeah. and then they pick up the film. Now, if the Iranians on any given day don't want to give them the film... Sure then do we know? We don't know. And, and, and so it gets into the weeds on some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sorry to, to get so technical, no, but no. I mean, but, but so there's a question here of at what point will you know uh, what they're, they're, they're doing? And Netanyahu's fear is that by next summer, they will have enough for one 20% bomb. And that is 90% of the way, as he, as he displayed very graphically at the <laughs> UN with the marker and all that. Yeah. That's 90% of the way towards the bomb. Right. And the belief is that at a time of their choosing, when we're having, we're diverted with our own crisis points, that they will, you know, they will then act when we're not looking, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And his fear is it's an easy dash. Once you've got that, 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 that enough uranium, then it's four right. to six weeks. And, his, and that's his fear. And I can tell you, look, I wrote a piece for the New Yorker magazine just now. Excellent piece. Thank you. And, the silent uh, strike. Yeah, the silent strike. And it was a fascinating learning experience mm -hmm. for me because, you know, it was a way to do a deep dive mm -hmm. into, um, into talking to all the key players on, on, on both sides of the ocean on an on a, on a episode that I felt had not been really excavated, you know. <laughs> so for me, it was a great privilege to do this. And one of the things I realized in doing this was that was uh, you know and, I, and, and there are a lot of there's more differences than similarities between Syria and Iran. I'm you know, mm -hmm. but but for the most part, the United the U.S. and Israel had the same information, and they reached opposite conclusions. <laughs> yeah, the U, the CIA checked out everything of Israel, mm -hmm. and I, and if I had more space in the article, I, I could explain even more how they checked it out. It, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And they came to the president and said, Mr. President, the Israelis are right. They really, this is a reactor. It's got no other purpose mm -hmm. but this. But we have a technical problem, Mr. President. We can't find <laughs> this reprocessing plant, mm -hmm. which is the weaponization. Now, Syria is not opening up their country the way, you know, the Iraqis did in the 90s and after the 2003 war. So it could be there. It could not be there. But Bush, you know, and, and he's a political guy. I mean, like, he's, he's living with the ghosts of Iraq, 
what the media they're going to say. I couldn't find WMD, Weapons of Mass Destruction, in 2003. Well, it's even, it's right. even freakier, but right. it's, we're, now, we're now looking at the anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, right. it's, and only because the guy flew over the island and saw a bunker. This right. very month, exactly. <laughs> right. and, I was just with Graham Allison uh, this weekend at Harvard, so <laughs> yeah. he was talking about that. Yeah. The 50th yeah. So he's, he's called this the Cuban Missile Crisis in slow motion. Exactly. Well, you know, and, yeah. and so, but what happened was, so the United States... So Bush said, look, in the post-Iraq era, the threshold for America to attack is very high. Mm -hmm. And basically, um, you might be right, Israel, that this thing is going to go hot. And by the time we find this reprocessing plant, it'll be too late. Mm -hmm. But we in the United States, having gone through wars, until I find that smoking gun of the reprocessing plant, even though I don't doubt you, and the CIA backs you up, that this is a, a, a you know um, a thing, uh, a reactor, and it is not for energy purposes. But until I find that little piece of the puzzle, my hands are tied. Right. Yeah, you know now, in this case, Israel acted, but I'll tell you that you had Condoleezza Rice, who was focused on these six power talks with North Korea, mm -hmm. didn't want to jeopardize mm -hmm. that uh, for this issue. And she said, no, we can't get into that. And then you had Robert Gates, who was the Secretary of Defense, who was very focused on the surge, which was just starting then, and proved to be very successful, but then they didn't know that mm -hmm. yeah. in, in, in the summer of 2007. And so they had other fish to fry. Yeah. And Israel's fear is, when it comes to Iran, there will always be other fish other to fish. fry. Right. And, that's, and, that's, the, and that's, that's why this stuff is so hard. If it was easy, it would have been solved a long time ago. I'm going to shift gears now. I think we've talked about this a, a lot. Uh, to the so-called Arab Spring, generically. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's had almost two years to work its way. Uh, events in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, mm -hmm. Syria. Have these events, do they add up to, and I know they're complicated and all kinds of separate side issues, but overall, so far, has this been an overall plus or minus for the stability of the region and the security and geopolitical interests of the United States and Israel? Wow, that's a hard one. It's very hard. Uh, <laughs> we yeah, need so an hour day up. Good questions. <laughs> uh, he asked great questions. I, it, it's very hard. I mean, look, on one hand, uh, just to give us a sense of what's at stake here, I mean, this is the, we're in the most tumultuous period since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. 1917. We're in a period, I would argue, even more dramatic than 1948, 1967. It doesn't just affect the Arab-Israeli bounds, it affects the whole region. And everything's become unhinged. And it's hard when you're living through an earthquake uh, to feel it all the time. But you are. So, uh, so it's, it's objectively hard. B, it's got the unbelievable hope uh, that the Arab people will go from being subjects to becoming citizens of their mm -hmm. society. That is breathtaking. That's historic by, by the, the, the lot largest standards. So you've got a lot of hopes, and, and, you've, and, you've, and you've got this unbelievable uh, t uh, sense of tumultuousness. But the problem is, is um, I'll come back to baseball, is that like we're only in the first inning of this game, right. and, and this is going to play out for a very long time. And uh, there's going to be a lot of this is going to be very hard, and and it's it's, and we have to be very cautious. A I'm predicting, but B, we have to realize that um, it is unleashing certain forces that certainly in the short and intermediate term are going to make American interests, going to make Israeli interests much harder. And the question is, do we get to the longer term? Um, it, that is, it's, it's, it, you know, the hope is in the long term, it's great. But we just don't know what the long term is. Is it 20 years? Is it 50 years? 10 years? I, we don't know. So we have to be humble because we're at the beginning of this long process. And in the short term, I think you have to say and that it poses more um, challenges and threats than it does hopes. Yes, ideally, the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt will come around to accepting the peace treaty uh, with Israel. And that, if that works, that's an amazing moment for the, for the region and, and for U.S. relations with the Islam, Israel's relations with the Islamists. That would be fantastic. 
but are we going to get there in, in a linear way? I'm not so sure, you know, and I think in America we grow up with this idea of, it's in our DNA, this belief that democracy is performance-based, that the brotherhood improves the economy, they're in. Uh, they don't improve the economy, they're gone. So give them a chance. But in, I lived in the Middle East, and the Middle East, the DNA is different, and that it's identity-based politics. It's not performance-based. And, you know, I mean, in Israel, you'd see the Shas party, the Aguda party. And I'm not here to, to make uh, equivalences. There's a lot of differences. So I don't want to offend anyone. But I'm just saying that those parties did not perform. Mm -hmm. they, but they, people had a sense of identification with their aspirations. They gave out money to their people. And they keep getting more and more voters. So we in America think, well, give the Brotherhood a shot. If it doesn't work, they'll be out. And if, it does, if they do perform, they'll have to modify because they have to take out the garbage, they have to govern, they have to do all these things. That's the hope. But my concern is that identity politics is, is a very powerful motif in the Middle East, and that has a lot of allure. David, thank you so much. Thanks brother. so much for spending time. Oh, delighted. I'm always happy. Uh, you know, to do whatever for the St. Louis Jewish life.